Hi everyone, thank you for coming to my talk. I'd like to begin by first uh, thanking the organizers of this important symposium on quantum crystallography, Professor Christoph Wozniak, Professor Florian Klimis, and Professor Yu Cheng Shen, and thank you all for being here. Thank you. The story I'm about to tell you is about extending the Bright-Wilson justification of the first hohenberg cohn theorem to non-nuclear attractors, a work done in collaboration with uh, James Ma Anderson, Aldo de Jesus Montera Carbonell, and Lou Massa. Since this symposium is about quantum crystallography, it's perhaps uh, an occasion to introduce the book that we will, uh, which will be released in September of uh, 2023 in just a couple of months. Now, the work I'm going to describe uh, today has been published in this uh, Kempfis Let uh, paper in 2021, and it has been extended a little bit this year, 23, in this uh, book that just appeared uh, in the literature. So, the plan of my talk is to remind the audience with the hohenberg cohn theorem, uh, discuss a little bit the cusps and the maxima in the electron density, the, what is the bright -Wilson's, Wilson's justification, what are nuclear maxima and attractor, and where do they occur, extension of this bright Wilson justification to non-nuclear maxima. And so we start with a reminder of a hohenberg cohn theorem, but before starting, let me just remind very briefly the audience with some aspect of the analysis of the electron density, since this, this theorem is based on the electron density, uh, which is afforded by the quantum theory of atoms and molecules of Bader. This theory starts from the electron density, it analyzes it, and then partitions the space, as you all know, uh, in, on the basis of the gradient vector field of the electron density. The electron density can be uh, approached from theory or from experiment, as you all know, and the cutane partitions the space. Here is a very simple molecule, boron trifluoride, uh, by um, analyzing the gradient vector field associated with the electron density, whereby uh, if you start climbing the gradient vector field lines that are in the vicinity of any given nucleus, you fall on that nucleus while there are very special set of gradient field lines that uh, when one start to climb them, uh, we will not reach any nucleus, but somewhere in between. In fact, they reach the so-called bond critical point, and of course, from here, you can only go up one way or the other, and in this way, you are tracing the bond path. So, the theory, in, in a very few lines, starting from Euler's identity, which then can be manipulated by uh, striking it in, in some constant to make it an energy density and so on, and generalizing to a case of a many electron wave function, uh, you can show in few lines that this equation is correct, whereby two forms of the kinetic energy densities are related by this equality that, is, that includes a term that is proportional to the Laplacian of the electron density. Now, the Laplacian of the electron density, this, this, uh, this term that is proportional to the Laplacian of the electron density, when integrated over all space, vanishes, and hence, only in this case, the, these um, potential energy density yield the same potential energy, K and G, over all space, and hence, we can just call them T, uh, and it's uniquely and well-defined, but this is not true for an arbitrary uh, space here. However, if this arbitrary space, instead of an arbitrary space, we include a, 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 an atom as defined by the zero flux surfaces, uh, then we have immediately, uh, because of the Bader zero flux condition, local zero flux condition, an equality here that will set the, the two forms, the, the, the Schrodinger and the, the, the gradient kinetic energy forms equal, and you have a well-defined kinetic energy for an atom in a molecule, which is not true for any arbitrary subvolume of the total molecular volume. And that leads directly to the important result that 
taking into consideration Bader's derivation of the uh, atomic virial theorem, then in this case, by using the, the atomic virial theorem, you can simplify the calculation of the energy of the contributions of an atom to the total energy in very simple form like this in a, by taking just the negative of its kinetic energy. So now we go back to the hohenberg cohn theorem. Uh, the, uh, these are the two authors of the theorem, clearly. Uh, it has been published in 64. And essentially, before I go there, I want to just define a, a term that, that is crucial in this theorem, which is the external potential, by reminding the reader, the, the, the viewer, um, of the uh, electronic Hamiltonian, where you have the electronic kinetic energy uh, operator, the electron nuclei operator, and the electron-electron repul uh, repulsion operator here. But we will focus on the electron nuclei attra attractive operator here. Um, so these elements of the operator, this is just the uh, electric constant, uh, and this is the atomic number, and these, this is the, um, the uh, this is missing E here. It should have an E. Um, this is the position of the, uh, the, the, the nuclei. So that whole thing is called the, um, the external potential. Uh, now, note that we have tacitly ignored the finite side of the atomic nuclei here. We consider the nuclei to be point charges, and that's important because this is where the cusp originates in the potential. So, Hohenberg and Cohn have shown by a proof ad absurdum uh, that you cannot have more than one potential, external potential, in other words, these, area, you know, these elements here in the Hamiltonian, that will lead to um, the same ground state. It's only one. There is a one-to-one -one mapping between one external potential and one ground state density. So the ground state density determines the potential, and the potential determines the Hamiltonian, and hence it determines the ground and excited states, and all the properties of the system are, uh, fu are functionals of the uh, ground state electron density. That's in a, in a very brief uh, very briefly, the essence of the Ho hohenberg cohn theorem. So now cusps and maxima in electron density. Nuclear cusps are an artifact of the, fine, of the zero size of the nuclei. We don't take the nuclear size into consideration, and this is why, because we don't take the nuclear size into consideration, uh, they are considered as cusp, in other words, a singularity, the derivative is not well defined at that cusp, and um, you know the, there are several. It's an excellent approximation, and there are even algorithms out there that will uh, correct for using a Gaussian basis set that will create uh, an actual maximum here. So with a derivative zero at the maximum, uh, when in fact, if we are operating under the zero finite side of the nucleus, that should have been a cusp. So there, is, there are even papers out there that provide algorithms to correct for this. Especially, this is especially important when we are interested in um, properties that are dependent on the nuclear, uh, on, the, on the density near the nuclei, such as NMR properties, for example. So the justification goes, goes like this. It's due to uh, Bright Wilson. It is often, these are the two references that are related to this justification of Bright-Wilson of the Hohenberg theorem. This is the one most often quoted, but it is not the correct one. This is the correct one, Lavdin, where he reminisces and recounts what happened uh, in the Sanibel Symposium of the day. Uh, so that's the right reference if you want to read about the original uh, argumentation or the original uh, thought process that led to this justification by, by Bright Wilson. Uh, <laughs> Yogi Berra uh, is famous, has famously said, you can see a lot by just looking. And that's what we do, actually, uh, in the first step of Bright Wilson justification. We just look at the electron density. This is the density of 
the DNA base pair, guanine cytosine, guanine on the left, cytosine on the, on the right, and you can see the nuclei here have these, ma these, these very high uh, maxima-like, but they are actually cusp truncated here because it's too high, while the hydrogen is, looks like a cusp indeed. So the first thing we do is just by looking here, we can get the number, you can just count the nuclei, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you count the nuclei, so you get the limit of the summation in the Hamiltonian, in the electronic Hamiltonian, and also in one, in the, by the same stroke, you get also the position of the nuclei, so you get that part of the Hamiltonian here written in atomic units, so now the electric constant is one, the electronic charge is one, uh, all the, the, the mass of the electron is one, so it's, it has that simpler format um, here as we see. So in one go, by just looking at the map, we have the position and the number of the nuclei. We, secondly, the electron density through simple integration get us the number of electrons. So we get the, the limit, the, the, the upper limit of the second summation here, the n, uh, gets just by integrating the electron density. Now, so in other words, so far we have determined the limits of the summations, we have determined the position of the nuclei, but we still haven't determined the uh, nuclear charge or atomic number here in atomic units, nuclear charge is the atomic number. So that comes from the Kato or Kato cusp condition, which written in atomic unit essentially tells us that the atomic number is inversely proportional to the uh, Electron de the spherically averaged electron density at the position of a given nucleus and the rate of change of that uh, spherically averaged density with respect to the radial distance from that nucleus. And here again is the base pair. You can see the cusps here at the position of the hydrogens. These, were, these are all truncated because they're just way too uh, large to um, dips display in the same scale here. So, by Cato cusp condition, the last remaining piece of the jigsaw puzzle is determined, which is the uh, atomic number, and, in, and hence the electron density, since this is just a spherically average electron density around the cusp, because you, don't, you cannot just take the, the, the derivative of the density with respect to the radial distance is not defined because of the singularity there, so this is why you need to average over a small sphere. So in other words, the rho r completely specifies and determines the Hamiltonian. It determines the limits of the summation, of the two summations, whether on the nuclei or on the electrons. It determines the position of the nuclei and their nature. So the Hamiltonian is uniquely defined by just looking at the density. Nuclear maxima and attractors. So again, uh, this is the main, these are the two main references. Um, Cusps, as I mentioned, are, are an artifact, is a singularity that occurs at the nuclear positions, but maxima can occur sometimes at other than nuclear positions. These maxima are known as non-nuclear maxima, if you want to, max to, to emphasize their uh, topographical and topological uh, role as a maximum in the density, or if you want to emphasize their role as an attractor to the gradient field vector lines. Um, uh, you can also call them non-nuclear attractors, which indicate their role as the pseudo-nucleus of a pseudo-atom, let's say. So uh, there is a very important paper that was published back then by Iverson, Larson, Suhasu, and Takata, uh, where they use maximal, maximum entropy method in order not to bias the refinement um, where they discover and report two types of non-nuclear maxima uh, in beryllium crystal. You can see them here, the, uh, indicated by the red. These are the non-nuclear maxima, and the blue are, non, are minima in the density, but the non-nuclear maxima are like this. But they found not one type, but they found two types, type 1 and type 2. They differ in their location. You know, the, the type 2 is in yellow here, the type 1 is in red. They differ in their location and the uh, value of the electron density at, at these local maxima, and these are the minima, and you can see that they form a network holding the crystal together. So 
before that, in 1987, uh, this work was published in 95. Before that, in 1987, uh, Carlo Gatti uh, and co-workers have published an important paper in theoretical, che theoretical chemistry account um, whereby the report displays of dilithium molecule uh, in, um, this is the, the, in the, this is the gradient vector field in, in a plane cutting through the nuclei, and you can see that there is no interatomic surface between the two lithiums, but rather there is an interatomic surface here between the lithium and a non-nuclear attractor basin, and another interatomic surface here, and there are two bond critical points, one from the nucleus of that lithium to the non-nuclear attractor pseudo-nucleus, and another bond critical point linking that non-real nucleus, or you know, pseudo-nucleus, to this lithium nucleus. So basins of non-nuclear attractors are pseudo-atoms. They behave in every way as if they are atoms in molecules and contribute to the energy of the molecule, the, the population of the, the molecule, everything. Just like uh, an atom but without a nucleus. So here is uh, our calculation, our recent calculation reported here, uh, which uh, compares very well with the previous calculation by Gatti et al. Um, and of course these are the zero flux surface here and you can define the energy of these uh, basins just in the normal way by taking uh, minus the kinetic energy of this basin, non-nuclear attractor basin. This is a second example that we also report here, whereby you can see the non-nuclear attractor basin here is squeezed, uh, this red thin basin here, and there are three bond critical points from the hydrogen. This is in the, in the hydrogen three ion. Um, and you can see that there are three bond paths linking each of the protons with the non-nuclear attractor. Uh, they, these pseudo-atoms follow, of course, the topological Poincaré-Hopf in case of molecules or Morse in case of crystal relationships. So here, for example, this is the Morse, the, the Poincaré-Hopf relationship in whereby there is a pseudo-atom in hydrated electrons. Uh, so here, this is a hexa-water uh, cluster whereby it is negatively charged, and you can see that uh, a significant part of this extra uh, charge on the six-water cluster is located between two fragments of three water uh, clusters each, and this is bonded to the hydrogens. This non-nuclear attractor shares bond paths and interatomic surfaces and everything uh, with the uh, hydrogens of these uh, clusters. And if you count the number of critical points and the non-nuclear attractor, uh, so I have 18 nuclei and one non-nuclear attractor, and these are the number of uh, bond critical points, including the ones to the non-nuclear attractor, this one, two, three, four, five, six. And if you consider the ring critical point and the cage critical point, you get, of course, uh, the identity uh, just as if it was another atom. Now that other atom, or pseudo-atom, has a significant amount of uh, electron population. In fact, it has about 0.23 electrons of one pure spin only. It's all, the the spin population is almost identical to the electron population. Uh, they are both almost equal, and they equal 0.2 electron. Um, the uh, the non-nuclear attractant basin energy is about 22 kilocalorie per mole, for example. That's its contribution to the total energy. So, extension of this argument for non-nuclear maxima. So, again, the density def determines the limit of the summations, the nature of the nuclei, and the position of these nuclei. So, can we extend this to also non-nuclear attractors, since they behave like nuclei anyway. Uh, that topic has been presented, or people have inquired upon it. Michael Johansson have uh, posted a CCL post back in uh, 2009 about the topic, um, incorrectly referring as uh, density cusps outside of the nuclei. They are not really cusps, they are actual uh, maxima, as we shall see in a moment. So. In my last five minutes, we will introduce spherically averaged 
the n here is the spherically average density. So it's, um, it's defined as this. It's, it's basically an integral over the two uh, polar angle of the density around the nucleus, nucleus alpha, let's say. We will introduce a new nomenclature here. We'll call that ratio the Cato or the Cato ratio. So now let's evaluate the derivative within the Cato ratio at a point P coinciding with a non-nuclear maximum. Well, if we follow the chain rule of the der derivative, here it is. And of course, since by definition, a non-nuclear maximum is a maximum in a scalar function. Therefore, the derivative of this function with any of the Cartesian coordinates is identically zero, and this whole thing collapses. And so the Cato ratio vanishes. This ratio here vanishes for uh, a non-nuclear attractor. Now let's see, is that all? How about the Cato ratio for an arbitrary well-behaved point, let's say a bond critical point or an arbitrary point, pick a point in the density. Uh, what does the Cato ratio uh, gives in this case? Well, we can look at uh, the very simple situation uh, of, um, uh, from a calculus uh, textbook whereby the gradient vector of a function at a position is always perpendicular to the tangent vector to any given curve uh, on the isosurface that passes through that point. So the quantity in bracket here can immediately be identified as the dot product between the gradient of the density and our prime vector defined in this way, and that by definition is zero, or by, uh, uh, by necessity is zero. So in other words, this thing is vanish, vanishes, and we can extend the, uh, um, the, the, the vanishing of this derivative not only to non-nuclear attractors, but in fact to any point except at the nuclear cusps where the derivative is simply not defined. So this is beautiful because it extended Cato's condition, and indeed the charge of the pseudo-atom by our extended Cato ratio um, is indeed zero as it should. Not surprising, perhaps, but it's a satisfying result. And perhaps it is intuitive, sure, but it hasn't been published before. Uh, so here are some numerical verification of these results. Here uh, we, we have used uh, Slater type orbitals here. We've used, we've used ADF uh, software uh, to, 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 to have uh, accurate representation near the nuclei. But here, for instance, we can see that our, uh, the, the calculated um, Z for a proton is one almost exactly. And by the way, this is, this is very near the nucleus. This is uh, one thousandth of an atomic unit. And this is extremely high electron density. As you can see, this is in tens of atomic units. So uh, these are very, very, these are very close to a nuclei and these are very high num very high values of the electron density. But you can see that the uh, Z calculation uh, numerically works well, including here, for example, Krypton 35 plus. So it's one electron atom or ion in this case that has uh, one electron and uh, 36 protons. So we get that very closely. Now in a molecule like lithium molecule, we also get the nuclear charge very closely to three. This is just to show that uh, the cusp is indeed looking as a cusp as it should um, for the hydrogen atom, for instance. So now we uh, verify it for the Cato ratio in a non-nuclear attractor, and this is how the behavior of the electron density very close to the non-nuclear attractor, again, this is very, very close. This is in thousands of atomic units. Uh, so th this is in thousandth of an atomic unit. So, so that's a 0 0.001 atomic unit. So it's very, very close to the uh, nucleus. You can see here that the, uh, in contrast to that uh, shape here, it's clearly curving into a maximum as it should, of course. And here you can see that the formula gives exactly zero. Numerical verification uh, at an arbitrary well-behaved point. We have applied this at the point critical point in hydrogen molecule ion, hydrogen molecular ion. 
it uh, behaves very well. And also in the case at an arbitrary point, at one-fourth of the distance from the bond critical point to the nucleus along the bond path, uh, again in the hydrogen molecule ion. So, concluding remarks, the spherical, uh, spherically averaged radial derivative of the density vanishes at any critical point where it is well behaved, uh, except for singularities, nuclear cusps, even at a, tr a true maximum, such as a non-nuclear attractor, a bond critical point, a ring critical point, a cage critical point, the Cato ratio is identically zero. Since the non-nuclear maximum is a well-behaved maximum, this result can be considered as an extension of the original K2 cusp condition. A non-nuclear maximum is a pseudo-nucleus, but with zero charge as required by the K2 ratio since it vanishes. A Wilson argument is intact and is applicable to the more general case where one has non-nuclear maxima in the electron density. And as a corollary, it can be shown very easily that the cathode ratio vanishes. In other words, the, the charge of the pseudo-atomic uh, pseudo basin is indeed, the charge of the nucleus of the pseudo-atomic basin is indeed zero as it should. And stated differently, for electronic system, the cathode ratio is zero at any point except at the nuclear cusps. So at the end, I'd like to thank these scientists, Professor Olympia Lombardi and Professor Paul Ayers for a lot of discussions and uh, these institutions for funding. And thank you again for attending this talk. And now the question period, Professor Lou Massa is in the audience and can, be, uh, can address some of your questions. Thank you very much.